All right. So Just give everyone a few more minutes to uh, join. How are we doing for participants? Oh, we're up to 23. So while we're waiting, does anybody want to put their hand up virtually to help us uh, with the scribing? We need somebody from the Jabber room to act as a Jabber uh, scribe to bring forward any important issues from there. And we also need uh, one or more volunteers to help us with the note-taking in Etherpad. Hey, Glenn, I'll help with note-taking. This is Barbara. Yeah, no, I recognize the voice. Thank you, Barbara. I can keep an eye on Jabber if that's useful, uh, Glenn. Oh, thank you, Andrew. I'll have to quickly log on to it because I forgot. So thank you also for reminding me that that's necessary. It feels like a Monday because my, my mouse just, in addition to not be able to unmute before a reboot, my mouse just informed me that its battery is low. <laughs> it needs a recharge. <laughs> is this a Monday? It feels like it's Wednesday, but it feels like a Monday. Okay, so we have we have a, a we have a, a note taker, we have a Jabber scribe. We're doing pretty well. Uh, I hear a lot of beeps, so we'll just give another minute for the beeping people to finish joining. What do you think, David? I, I'm hearing the beeps have settled out. Do you think we should start? Yeah, I do. Um... I have a quick question, though, because I'm not sure, because I, as I see Barry typing into the blue sheet right now, and he should know the answer to this, but do we not, um, I imagine the blue sheet attendance would be taken from WebEx attendance, but maybe not. So not. do people need to sign the blue sheet is the question. Yes, they, they do. They, they, I, don't, I don't think we have access to the, the attendance things, and, and people can put whatever they want to put in for WebEx when they, when they join. It's not a, like a restricted to like, you know, you put your real name in. So people should be doing the blue sheets inside the uh, etherpad. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I personally have that on a different computer. So I'm typing it into this computer so that I can share it in chat unless somebody's already done that. Now, so clarifying what, uh, when, when we have the, the IETF meetings and we're using meet echo, we have authentication for that. So we're using the meet echo logs for blue sheets. But for the interim meetings on uh, WebEx, we don't have that. So. And so. Yeah, for people looking for the blue sheet right now on the screen is the URL. It's also in that data I tracker. I the link to chat too. And it's in chat. So, all right, I'll go back to the main thing. So uh, welcome to the ADD uh, t first interim in 2021. Um, I'm your co-chair, Glenn Dean, and with my other co-chair, David Lawrence. Uh, we have had some very good interims in the last, um, uh, since we, I think we did a pair back in September. We had some great conversations during them and actually, I think, produced a lot of uh, momentum going forward. We talked about authenticated and unauthenticated networks in the past. We've talked about this concept of equivalency and, and, and how we sort of feel about, you know, where things fit and, 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 and that approach. Uh, and I think this really moved the group very effectively along. So thank you for your participation at the interns, and thank you for coming today. Uh, again, here's the co-chairs. Uh, I, I, I do not have hair like that anymore. I, I now have hair, and I think David as well. We both have very long hair now, so these, these pictures need to be updated. <laughs> but do you have pandemic beards? Uh, no. no. I've been trimming my beard, but I am going on a year without a haircut now. So. <laughs> Uh, please be aware, this is an ITF official meeting, so uh, note well does apply, so please read it and be aware of its provisions. Uh, in terms of uh, tips for the meeting, we will be using the WebEx chat to manage the queue. Uh, so please, uh, when we do open the mic line, uh, go there, add a plus queue to add yourself, do a minus queue to take yourself out, 
Uh, David Lawrence will be managing the queue uh, and, and the, those sessions, and I will be managing the screens and the presentations. Uh, we also have, of course, the Etherpad for note taking, uh, and we have a Java room as below. These are pretty standard, and if you don't have the links, they're also available in Data Tracker and in the chat session. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, it's broken into uh, essentially three parts. So th this is the first part where we do the administrative stuff. So please uh, go in and, and add yourself to the blue sheet inside the Etherpad, uh, name, affiliation, and email. Uh, we uh, have three presentations that are going to be given yeah. today. Yeah. There's a, a quick question from chat actually about do we need to provide email address because if this becomes public record, it's another source of spam, blah, blah, blah. Um, cool. So we do not publish that part of it out to, uh, so I actually clip off that part of it before we store these as, as uh, records for the meeting. Okay. And that's sent to the ITF secretary and only the actual minute meetings will appear in the minute records. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what else? Oh, sorry, getting back to dark. We have three presentations. Uh, so the first one will be from a, a design group that the chairs uh, helped kick off uh, that worked with the draft box requirements uh, and has produced a new, uh, quite substantial revision uh, to uh, draft box requirements. Uh, and, and that was released a couple of days ago to the group. Uh, we'll have a 15 minute overview from that group and, and, and the output from that. Uh, followed by, uh, we have a BTW Home uh, 12 draft that's going to be uh, presented, and uh, draft poly gear. And my apologies on, on both those on the updates on the slides. I failed to put in the dash ADV uh, to indicate that they are part of our group. Uh, but anyways, uh, and on the on the last bit on the draft poly gear, uh, the links and everything you have right now, that draft was out for working group adoption. I'm going to call it unless David wants to object with me. I've seen no objections on the list to adopting uh, that adoption thing and that adoption call closed yesterday. Uh, but in the sake of this meeting, everyone's links working. I haven't taken any action to advance that to a working group draft with the updated links. Uh, so I will do that after this meeting. But uh, draft poly ADD deer has been adopted by the working group as a working group draft. Uh, after that set of updates, we're going to have a very short little break uh, so people can grab an extra coffee if they need it or hit, hit the bio for about five minutes. And then we're going to open the floor up for discussion. And it's any topic uh, is, is fair game. Essentially, I'm expecting people will talk about what was just presented. But if there's other issues or comments you want to make, that is your opportunity to make them. And then at the very end, we'll reserve five minutes to talk about IETF 110. Is everyone okay with that? Any major, uh, anybody want to propose a uh, deviation from that agenda? Okay, I'll, I'll consider agenda bash has been completed. So, um, who is speaking to the design work and box requirements? So, I'm going to kick that off, but um, I'll hand over to the others because we're each going to talk about different parts of the slides. All right, well, let me bring the um, slides up. What's what should we do in terms of video? Should I turn mine on? Or are we trying um, to avoid that? It's your choice, Chris. I don't. I don't okay. think it's not critical. Chris, AC. I think we can leave video but, off just to you know uh, be considerate of lower bandwidth connections, and everybody should only really be looking at the slides anyway. So, okay. Um, well, yours, Chris, you have fifteen minutes. Well, total, you have fifteen minutes total for your group. Um, unfortunately, Webex is just frozen because I. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hear you. Yeah. The slide, and I'm showing the slide. So we have right now the title slide up. Okay. Uh, emerging use cases for encrypted DNS. Okay. All right. So, um, the the idea here is, um, yeah, as Glenn said that we, as a group, we kind of um, came together from different directions to to try and find. Um, some interesting ways forward. Um, and I think that's been relatively successful. So one part of that is just thinking about um, the requirements draft that, that was presented last time. And we, we had a lot of debate about um, it, what was meant by equivalence. So if we go on to the, the next slide, um, that that debate um, 
which I'll come on to. Um, but we also we also looked at what else do we have in this space? We've got deer, we've, which says, yeah, that gives you a mechanism to do discovery from a resolver. And we've got the ADD um, home draft that tells you how you can do discovery in it from a network. Um, so we've, as well as um, simple designation, which is what, what my new version is, is talking about, um, we've also got some, some ideas about going beyond that. So if we go on to the next slide, um, so the main changes compared to 01 of the draft um, is that because we had a lot of debate about what is meant by equivalence, um, and, and that's for good reasons that networks and resolvers and users, they're all diverse and um, they have different needs. So this draft doesn't use that word equivalence. It just, it just talks about how do you designate um, a resolver. And designation is is the same kind of process that we have at the moment. It's um, it's saying, I think, or here's my recommendation. I think that this re um, resolver here, whether that's port 53 or whether it's encrypted, is. Oh, did we lose Chris? We did lose Chris. So maybe that's why he's having WebEx problems, a little flake on the internet there. Um, okay. okay. We'll Hi, we'll this is Ben Schwartz. Uh, okay, Ben, you want to take I over? Think, I think I'll, I'll pick up, and if Chris comes back, uh, he can he can tell Sounds us. Sounds good. Say if I, I've oh. missed anything. So, uh, yeah. So the the key thing I think here is that designated designation is an assertion by the by the party that's providing the designation that a resolver is safe and appropriate to use automatically. So I think that is going to be very close to what some people meant by equivalent, but hopefully it's more explicit and, and less ambiguous. Uh, and this is not uh, talking about policy, it's, it's talking about providing information to the clients and what the clients do with that is, is not really in scope. Uh, next slide. So, that's the, the existing draft. We also, in this presentation, have three sketches of other scenarios that go beyond this to more advanced use cases. You can think of each of these sections like a, a sketch of a requirements draft that analyzes some potential collection of use cases. Uh, so the first one presented by Tiru will be about configuration where the user has identified, authenticated, and explicitly authorized a particular network to control configuration. Uh, the second will be about resolvers describing themselves in more detail. And the third will be about collections of resolvers. The word directory has been contentious here. So collection might be a, a better term. It's just meaning a list. Next slide. So the reason we're presenting this is to get feedback, to find out whether the working group wants to move forward with any or some of these areas. And wherever there's interest and, and potential for consensus, we can try to put together a proper requirements draft and protocols to serve it. Ben, if I could interrupt for a second, could people that aren't speaking please put themselves on mute? I'm hearing a keyboard typing in the background and some breathing. Thank you. Next slide. Just to be clear, we're not proposing that the working group has to solve all of these scenarios. These are offerings to the working group to see what people are interested in trying to solve. And we're not trying to take control away from the client here, but we uh, and we're not trying to communicate policy instructions to the client. What we're telling, uh, what we're trying to do here is, is provide more information flows between resolvers, clients, and networks in ways that uh, are useful for all parties to accomplish their goals. And I'll hand it over to Tiro. Hey, thanks, Ben. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, uh, this section is specifically with regard to enterprise networks where uh, 
the endpoint uh, typically a, a priority device would have connected to the enterprise network using the unique credentials that is provided by the IT admin. And in those cases, uh, this use cases are basically talking about scenarios where you have an unmanaged POD device, which is very common. And how do you provision these devices to use the enterprise uh, uh, DOH or DOT server? And then, <clears throat> and then the user would have authorized the client to override the local DNS setting on these networks. And uh, in addition to BYD, we, we now see an explosion of IoT devices that join these enterprise networks, and many of these devices may or may not have a device management tool. So if these devices, both BYD and IoT devices, can be provisioned with the enterprise uh, and, and encrypted DNS servers. Next slide. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. So the standard discovery mechanisms that would work for BOD and IoT devices, either it could be based on the existing mechanisms that the working group has already come up with, or is there any better way because there is an explicit pre-configuration and trust between the endpoints and the network in this case. Uh, <clears throat> the One of the most important one that we've been discussing was uh, discovering the local names. Uh, basically similar to split horizon DNS where the endpoint would want to know what are the internal domain names uh, that the enterprise DNS server would resolve. Uh, this is very similar to what we see in uh, Ike V2 or uh, spread VPN scenarios where the VPN client would learn the internal domain names and use the internal DNS server to resolve only those domain names. So that way, the endpoint has a flexibility to either pick the enterprise DNS server to resolve all the domains or just use the enterprise DNS server to only resolve the local domains uh, for which uh, uh, the enterprise DNS server is acting as the authoritative server. Uh, we've seen several uh, uh, working groups at IETF. I mean, uh, if if you if we decide to have any uh, new standardized discovery mechanisms beyond network discovery or uh, DNS-based discovery that the working group has already adapted, there seems to be some work happening at least in uh, 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 Anima working group with regard to bootstrapping remote security infrastructure, which talks about bootstrapping IoT devices with network configuration, both for authentication and other configuration purposes. Uh, that's a secure mechanism, unlike the mechanisms that the working group has discussed. Ike V2 has already proposed various extensions to learn the DNS server information and other local network configuration using Ike V2 extension. So that's one extension that could be easily done, which would leverage the existing Ike V2 mechanism without having to invent a new uh, secure discovery mechanism. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, what we have been discussing is, hey, do, what kind of devices would need this? And what we have identified is that uh, if you have IT managed devices and IoT devices with a device management tool, it's pretty easy for this device management tool to configure and uh, decide whether the uh, IT managed device or IoT device needs to uh, send all the DNS queries to the enterprise DNS server or just to split horizon DNS and provide the internal domain name. So uh, the goal is not to target these kind of devices which are managed by uh, any device management tool and even BOD devices managed by MDM can be provisioned with that. Uh, we also seen uh, BOD devices typically deployed in enterprise networks with a configuration profile. Uh, the configuration profile would probably uh, today uh, provides the endpoint with a uh, client certificate for 802.11 authentication. It also provides various configuration information related to the enterprise network configuration. It's, it's a secure configuration that happens today, and even that could be extended to provide the information that we are discussing. So these uh, uh, type of devices with MDM or configuration profiles are beyond the scope. So the scope is pretty much restricted to uh, unmanaged BYD devices without any MDM. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, I'll I'll like uh, Tommy to take over this one. Hello. Hi, Sarah. So the second category of use cases that we are proposing may be useful for the working group are those where the resolver can describe its own behavior and properties. Um, one example or one category of examples listed here is defining local only namespaces where say a company may have a resolver that is uniquely aware of corporation specific namespaces that can tell clients that only it can resolve certain names. Uh, next slide, please. Another category is per namespace optimization. Uh, there are several cases today where content providers will actually allow ISPs to have local caches 
where an ISP resolver may know that it can provide an optimized uh, result to a query that the client will probably not get from other resolvers. Next slide, please. Defining the resolver's identity in a more useful way. Um, one example may be that the resolver can provide human friendly descriptions that can power UI to make DNS UI more user friendly. Another example is to provide human legible documentation, things like debugging or other documentation that may have to be found via web searches today. The idea behind this use case specific that we should specifically call out is that these descriptions should not be used by the protocol automatically to make decisions. This isn't about providing any verifiable trust. It's about optional interaction. So this would not be, for example, a good way to say, these are the terms of service a user must agree to. This is all about optional documentation that would allow a debugger or a curious user to gain more information about the resolver without having to know how to look it up on the internet by themselves. Next slide, please. The other category would be defining protocol support beyond what's needed to connect. Um, one example is, DNS extended errors, are there specific codes that the server would like to give the client a heads up it should expect with frequency? Um, but a more common example would be access controlled resolvers. If the resolver requires client authentication uh, to log in, as it were, it should be able to describe what is required to do that and how to signal that the authentication has failed and how to try again. Next slide, please. I'll hand the third category of use cases off to Jim. Yeah. Thanks, Tommy. So the third scenario is perhaps the more general case here, where we're looking at the potential for having lots of different resolvers that could potentially be chosen and used for resolution service. So we're thinking here of essentially there are three actors in this. There'll be some sort of publisher that creates and maintains some list of distinct resolvers. Uh, the client, obviously, which is going to retrieve that list somehow, sees me hand-waving frantically. And then there are the resolvers themselves that are in that list, or sets of lists, depending on who's actually providing it. Now, as Tommy, oh, sorry, as Ben pointed out earlier, um, the word directories is perhaps a little bit loaded in context. Really, the sense here is just a list or a collection or assemblage of names of resolvers or details about the resolvers. We're not looking at something that would imply some kind of directory-based search or lookup mechanism to locate this kind of information. Next slide, please. So the sample use cases we have in mind here would be an application that's going to give the user or users a set of resolvers to consider. And that list of, user, that list of resolver servers could be provided potentially by a third party. We've also got the scenario of a software vendor who we may be maintaining a list of trusted resolvers with some definition of trust and needs to update that list without requiring an update of the software itself. So the sort of scenario that might apply to something similar to what Mozilla is doing with its TIR, TRR service in Firefox. And finally, we have the scenario where an end user may want to select from a resolver that's offered from somebody else's list, say by a network operator that we trust, and again, for some definition of trust. Next slide, please. And what we've decided would be the requirements for this kind of thing is the list could be published by a trusted network. and We've not made any opinions yet about where and how that could be published. Presumably, it could be available as a URL. Maybe it'll go to the DNS. These things are still up for discussion. But obviously, that list has to be made available to the device in some manner. The resolver will describe its own self-description, how it's been entered into that list of the resolver's capabilities. And the protocols that are going to be used for doing that self-description and so on are the ones that Toby and Tina have mentioned before. Uh, element in the presentation. We'll give potential the ability for the publisher to offer non-repudiability so that whenever the list is published, the end client is a reasonable satisfaction of knowing that the information that's being provided by the publisher can be verified. Maybe it'll be verified by DNSSEC, maybe it'll be verified because it's been retrieved over some sort of TLS connection. 
again, we haven't really given any definitions about what would that amount, what those characteristics might be, just that this will be an option that should be available. And there's obviously potentially an on-screen interactive menu in the case of user wants to know pick the result of choice that they want. Next slide, please. Things we've expressly looked, decided not to make part of the requirements is defending against malicious or inept behaviour either by the publisher or, or the resolver. Module this information potentially of the reputability of the data you get from the publisher. We're not going to consider cases where there's going to be extremely long list of resolvers. The number here is up for grabs. More than a thousand seems ridiculous. Maybe I would have thought the below tens would be a reasonably long enough list. But again, we've not made any final decisions about that, and maybe the working group might have some suggestions on that. We're also not going to consider the case of not needing to use a bootstrap resolver to initially get to that secure connection being established. And also for the cases where you need to assemble information for a bunch of resolvers because the resolvers are offered to you only after of some of the characteristics that you need from. So we're not trying to combine these, we expect the client to combine those together. And with that, I think I'm done. The next slide says questions, and I think from Glenn's point of view and also from David's point of view, questions at this stage might be on the clarifications of what's just been presented rather than the detailed discussion, which I think we're going to have shortly. Actually, I'd like to hold off all questions uh, right now, Jim. Um, we, we have two short pre presentations I want to get through. So people, what I recommend is just jot down on a little notepad the questions you have, and we'll bring them up after the uh, next two presentations. Okay, Glenn, thanks. Okay, awesome. Um, well, going back to our agenda, uh, let's see here. If I can get it to come up, there we go. So the next one is the uh, BTW Home 12 draft. Let me your slides up and Kira, are you speaking to this one? Yes, uh, I see Matt is having audio issues, so I'll, I'll present this one. Okay. Let me bring it up. Okay, okay just let me know when you want to switch slides. Yeah, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so what we have done in the last couple of revisions is to uh, update the draft to address several comments that we received from the working group. Uh, uh, I think we have presented this draft several times, so I'll just probably quickly walk over the critical pieces that uh, this draft proposes uh, DHCP RA extensions to provide the uh, entry DNS server that the network offers. And uh, it returns both the authenticated domain name and a list of IP addresses where the encrypted DNS server resides. Uh, it could return more, one or more uh, encrypted DNS protocols that the DNS server supports. And these servers may be hosted on the same or different IP addresses than the ClearText DNS uh, server. And uh, the DNS extensor also sub supports uh, alternate port numbers, which uh, DOT and DOQ do talk about, and DOH typically runs on 443. So uh, it also discusses uh, a list of IP addresses that would be written and they are ordered. And it has some optimizations with regard to uh, reducing the DHCP response size, especially to handle fragmentation. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the main changes that we have done in this draft is to uh, clarify the relationship with DIR and DIR is especially useful for uh, legacy network devices which can be upgraded in which cases DIR can, can really help to uh, use as a fallback mechanism for those endpoint, uh, network devices which can be upgraded. And uh, uh, for instance, in case if you have a home router which can be upgraded, then DIR can be used to discover the ISP provided resolver. And we have generalized this specification to show that it could be used in not just in home and other network deployments as well. And uh, <clears throat> we also updated the draft to return uh, IP addresses in addition to the domain name so that uh, the client does not have to fall back to uh, DNS or 53 to uh, probe the network and learn the IP addresses. Uh, and this is especially useful if uh, the encrypted DNS services are not hosted on the same IP address as the clear text DNS server. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, one of the uh, questions that we have for the working group is uh, after the client learns the uh, domain name, uh, what should you do with regard to learning the URI templates that the DOH server supports? Uh, so we have two options in the draft currently. Either we uh, rely on the DIR mechanism to use DNS to learn the URI templates or use a uh, uh, DHCP RA message to learn the URI templates. I mean, both the mechanisms have their own pros and cons, and we have tried to identify which mechanism is a better uh, one. And what we have identified is uh, sending the URI templates in the RA DHCP messages has several advantages, for instance, uh, 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 especially in cases where if, if, if for example, my ISP provides multiple DOH services like malware filtering and no filtering, and if the home admin chooses malware filtering, then uh, that specific configuration could be provided to the DHCP URI option, uh, which could not be done using uh, the DIR uh, option that we have. And it also gives us gives flexibility that there is no need to do any DO53 lookup. And <clears throat> the, one of the biggest advantages like the working group has discussed in the past is uh, DHCP and RA are only susceptible to internal attacks, and whereas uh, uh, the uh, if you fall back to uh, the special use domain name, then it could be it would be falling back to opportunistic encryption and could be susceptible to external attacks. So uh, we wanted uh, feedback from the working group to decide if this option is uh, what the working group wants, so that we can continue using uh, DHCP options to convey the URI templates and to uh, have a section where we discuss because that this option takes precedence over tier, and if this option is not there, then uh, DIR is the way to discover uh, the resolver provided uh, encrypted resolvers. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is the case where, uh, 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 in case if, uh, let's imagine if the DO53 and encrypted DNS servers are hosted on the same IP addresses, do we need, uh, is it, we see no need to return IP addresses again for the uh, encrypted DNS servers. So in that case, uh, uh, the IP addresses used for DO53 could be leveraged for DNS, encrypted DNS itself, and that would reduce the message size. So that's one optimization that we plan to do in the next revision. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, I think we have been addressing the comments from the working group for quite a few revisions, and uh, we would like to consider this draft for working group adoption. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. Thanks. And, yeah, and, and and from the chair's perspective, we'll um, after this meeting, we'll see where things are at, and we will consider uh, putting out the working group call. For adoption. Thanks. All right, and then lastly, Tommy Polly. Um, All right, you're up. Thank you. Um, so I'll be presenting um, just the status of the open issues on Deer, which is now going to be adopted. Um, and the current title and the acronym is for the discovery of equivalent encrypted resolvers. Um, given the discussion around equivalency, that will likely change but the content of the protocol remains the same. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as we mentioned, we have the adoption call. We'll go over the issues now. Next slide. Um, and if you get the PDF of the slides, that link will take you to the GitHub issues list. Um, so I'm just trying to summarize kind of the different categories of issues and comments we had during the adoption call. First, um, kind of the obvious bike shed is the name and terminology. Um, it currently refers to equivalent resolvers. That was mainly just because that was what the requirements draft was specifying then. Um, based on our discussion, we want to change that. Um, it, I think talking about discovery of designated resolvers would make a lot of sense. Um, it doesn't really fundamentally change the mechanism. But I think from the author's perspective, we'd like to have a new name acronym for when we upload a working group draft. Um, one option is to switch it from Deer over to Dance Dance Revolution. I mean, discovery of designated resolvers. Um, if other people have opinions or bike sheds, just let us know. Next slide. Um, so there are a couple of different issues and comments around the use of the special use domain name, which is currently specified as DNS resolver at ARPA. Um, just to summarize some of the issues, and you can chime in on those on GitHub. 
Um, there's questions around how this interacts with opportunistic attempts. Um, I think the view we have is that having these queries and getting the information about the DOE URI name and path is still useful, um, particularly for DOE over DOT. Um, this allows clients to avoid hard coding the path that they expect the DOE server to be running on. It also allows them to do a bit more of a normal uh, certificate evaluation for a name and have an authority request for a specific name rather than being um, try, trying to infer or guess what that name would be. So we think it still is a very important piece. Um, there do need to be some clarifications about how recursives handle it, how um, this can have impact on root name servers if people try to resolve this all the way up and how to handle errors. And there's text that Ben pointed out that we should remove around uh, caching. So. Next slide, please. Um, there are also a couple of other uh, details for opportunistic mode. Um, in particular, there is a PR from Ben Schwartz that um, proposes a way to upgrade um, to private IP address, an alternate private IP address. So currently the draft allows you to have a different IP address for your resolver as long as these the original IP addresses are kind of public IP addresses for which you can have a certificate. It does not allow you to switch IP addresses when you're using private IP addresses. Um, ben has a proposal for this, and so this is something that I think still needs a little bit of discussion around some details, but seems like a good direction to fold in, and we'd like to have that discussion with the working group as a whole. Um, it also adds some nice features like um, describing how you can handle C names off of the special use domain. Next slide, please. Um, we want to do a couple updates around the text for the use of the service binding records. Um, there's some text there for address hints and how they're used that um, make it sound like you can only use the address hints and not do any other queries. This is not technically correct. Um, they're more of an optimization, so we need to update that. Also um, on the mailing list, I think Stephen Farrell had some comments just kind of asking about the overall status of the client support for S SVCB. Um, I think we believe that it is an appropriate thing to use from the measurements we've done. And um, you know, just speaking for myself, we've been running queries for SVCB um, on iOS and macOS devices for six months now on the public releases and things have been going well there. So I think um, it is appropriate, but that is of course something that we can continue to discuss as a working group. Next slide. And then finally, um, there have you know, of course been discussions around the specific certificate requirements. Um, around the use of IP addresses and certificates for the public um, IP address upgrades. Um, I, I think, you know, we believe that this is an appropriate mechanism for the addresses that are eligible to have certificates. Um, but I, I think there does need to be some clarification around the requirements as far as having the addresses and names in the certificates. Um, I don't think it fundamentally changes a lot of what the client will do, but it will tighten up um, the requirements and you know, exactly which ones are driving the security needs. And I think that's it. Next slide. Yeah, so um, after the break, when we're talking, happy to hear thoughts and comments on any of this. Uh, I think the main thing will just be you know, let's get on the right foot for naming and any other issues that we want to resolve in the initial working group draft version. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, and thank you to all the presenters. Uh, so we're going to take a very short break and then we'll open up for the mic line. So I see uh, just coming up to 839. Uh, let's give everybody five minutes. 
So uh, let's be back at uh, 8.44 a.m. Pacific time. So 44 minutes after the hour, wherever you're living. <laughs> Get those coffees refilled, guys.
Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome back. It's 44 past the hour, or a half hour later in Newfoundland if you're from Canada. <laughs> uh, that's an old joke. They used to put that on the TV stations. Whenever they tell you what time the TV show was on, they always would indicate it was at such and such a time and a half hour later in Newfoundland. So you sort of got used to just hearing that as a kid. Um, so welcome back. David, are you online? Are you back? David Lawrence? Nope, we haven't got our key manager back yet. We have another minute then. David, you're back. I am indeed. Oh, there you are. Hello, sir. So uh, the way we're going to manage the WebEx thing is you put your uh, your name in the plus Q to join, the minus Q to leave. We're all old experts at this. So the mic line is now open. David, you're in charge. Uh, at the moment, I don't see anybody queued, so. Come one, come on all. So jumping over to the Jabber chat to see. Okay, Andrew's covering Jabber if somebody's talking there. Ecker, please. Howdy. Um, thanks everyone for presenting. Um, uh, I have to admit, I sort of um, watched that first presentation with a feeling of dread about the level of scope creep I see here. Um, the, uh, um, it seemed like we were converging on a relatively narrow scope. Um, initially, um, the, the scope largely filled by deer, um, and to some extent by um, uh, uh, BTW. Um, so, so, sorry, by, by BTW Home. Um, it, it seems to be we should like stick to that scope, which is to say, how like endpoints to learn the set of resolvers, which like their network things they might want to use. Um, it seems to me deer. Um, we already agree to accept deer, which clearly like fits in that in that category. Um, um, I'm open to being persuaded that um, that it would be useful to also standardize a DHCP, DHCP RA mechanism, um, sorry, RA mechanism um, as a, a, as BW Home suggests. Um, I think we should stop there. Um, um, and um, since I'm at the mic, um, um, I, it seems like it'd be very attractive, um, given that um, BW Home and Deer more or less more or less standardizing and delivering the same information. Um, via different channels, the right thing to do here would be try to standardize the data format having to level the same thing. Thank you, Ecker. Ralph Faber. Um, yeah, so thanks for the presentations. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if we should stop after the initial goals that we had, but I agree with Ecker that uh, Deer and uh, BTW Home really uh, should get us uh, the first kind of uh, goal goal post where we have uh, clients automatically upgrade to encrypted resolvers. So, on the uh, draft specifically, I mean, there was a question on the URI scheme for uh, BTW Home, and I think we should pretty much keep that to DHCP RA because uh, there is in the ecosystem stuff like RA or, or DHCP Guard that kind of gives some security on the lower network levels. There is no such thing in DNS, which is the, is the automatic upgrade. Now, there is the need for an automatic upgrade with, with DEER, so I uh, support adoption of both drafts, um, um, but in, to, in the kind of RA uh, DHCP scheme, we should stay there and not switch over to DEER. Um, the DEER trap also uh, has, has my support, and. I have one question. You talked about SVCP records. Now, I looked in a lot of DNS data lately. I didn't see a single SVCP record. I guess you're talking about HTTPS records, right, Tommy? Uh, yes, that is correct, to just to jump in. Um, I was referring to SVCP records in the, the, the general draft sense, including both of those and HTTPS records. You're correct that they are HTTPS records. Okay, um, but actually, um, we are also currently relying on a draft from Ben Schwartz, and he's in the queue later, so he can 
comment about that um, using kind of the DNS domain of that specifically. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you both. Uh, Glenn. Heather, wearing no hat uh, other than participant. Um, I wanted to make a comment uh, of the on the requirements draft that uh, Jim presented on Jim Reed and this notion of like, you know, that there's some form of a thing you get back at a URL. I kind of like that. And ultimately, if there's some form of uh, maybe like a, a, a signed JSON document as, as part of the, the concept for people when they're doing design work here, um, that, that might be useful to be able to actually have a means to, you know, I like that ability to display it. I also like the ability for um, some kind of security maybe added into that list that is published, uh, maybe by some signing mechanism, just as an idea for thought. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, ben Schwartz, please. Ben Schwartz. Uh, so to, to Ecker and Ralph's point uh, about scope here, uh, what I'll say is I think the, I think the working group has its priorities straight. I think that the, the current work that the working group is clearly the, the highest priority and best motivated. And what we were trying to do with this uh, with this presentation is to sort of lay out what what is possible beyond our current scope. I do think that we're looking at essentially diminishing returns. The um, the subsequent things that we've proposed, the sort of next steps, are less useful than the first steps because uh, you know we did the most important thing first, and it may well be that they're sort of below threshold in terms of what's worth. Uh, standardizing, especially given that they're they're all in different ways speculative. They're they're considering use cases that are are currently not really active. So I think that's up to the working group to to decide. Thank you, Ben. Tommy, please. I think the EDM program is Tommy. Yeah, yep. that's me. Yeah, sorry, I was just unmuting. Mm -hmm. um, so just to echo a couple of comments here, um, talking about what we're doing in DEER for DNS-based discovery and DHCPRA, that is something that I hope we can reuse the format um, and the approach as much as possible. Um, I think it's fine to have the information be in DHCP and not necessarily switch over to DNS, but I think what's important is that we come up with a common methodology for encoding different uh, different things, such that let's say you know we want to add DNS over quick later or some other new type of DNS encryption that we don't have to come up with separate ways of describing that and encoding it in different protocols. Um, and that's why when we're talking about how would we send this in IKV2? When we had that meeting in the IPsec group, um, I was encouraging them to, you know, kind of wait for ADD to decide what the format is and then just hoist that format into any other protocol. Um, a couple other minor points. Um, as I noted, we are in DEER currently relying on. Um, the use of SVCB that's defined in a draft that Ben Schwartz has, and that one I believe is not currently adopted anywhere. So we should talk about, you know, what is the path for that document? Do we want that to be folded in to what we've already adopted? Should it be a separate document that's adopted here or in another DMS working group? If I can jump in with my chair hat on there, uh, Tommy. That's a good yeah, question. Um, uh, the uh, we've been talking. The chairs of ADD have been talking with the chairs of the other um, DNS groups uh, about that. And so right now we're waiting for the uh, the, the progress on uh, SVCB itself to progress along to where it gets actually. I guess my understanding is that it's it's either in or approaching working group last call. Mm -hmm. uh, once that's done, then we will have a final discussion among the chairs. Of the groups on which group should take up uh, Ben's um, smaller draft that uses SVCB. So stay Perfect. tuned, but it's 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 being tracked. That's great. That's great to know. Um, and then the last comment I'll make is um, to Ecker's original point of kind of the scope. I, I definitely agree that we don't want 
scope creep. Um, and I, I think the set of things we have now is something very concrete that the working group should work on and ship first. And I, I would encourage people to try to view maybe some of those other use cases as things that can be um, written as extensions to the mechanisms we're talking about here. You know, how much can we define them as extensions to what we're doing in Deer, et cetera, and leave open the ability for people to experiment and to work on new uh, deployment models without having that be a focus of this working group necessarily. Maybe this working group will close before those um, ever kind of become fully standardized, and maybe that's going to be another future working group's job to do. Um, thank you, Tommy. Andrew Campling? All right. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, rather helpful that uh, following on uh, rather neatly from what Tommy just said, um, I, I, I do think it's a good idea to adopt the user requirements um, document, and I think it's helpful to actually try and capture the, the full breadth of, of the requirements with, without saying that they all have to be solved, because at least then we've got a clear documentation of what they actually are. Um, uh, so, so there's something to at least review the uh, solutions against, uh, and if some of them end up not being solved, so be it, but, but at least they're documented. I think that's, that's helpful. Um, so I, I, th I think it's appropriate to uh, move ahead with the user requirements document. Um, and for what it's worth, I think there are some good things in there. Um, and then secondly, um, on the DEER draft, um, on the if, if I recall correctly from the discussion on the list, the point about certificates was to avoid specifying things which um, encouraged uh, the, for yet more centralization um uh acti activity i think that if i record and apologies i've got this slightly wrong that was very simplistically the concern that, that, that stephen raised i thought it was a good concern um to, to uh, make sure that we're conscious of that we're, that uh, we, we don't make the current sort of drift towards centralization even worse um even if uh, doing we've done so accidentally um so i think we should be mindful of that thank you Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Daniel Miguel. Hi. So um, I, ju I jumped into to the queue because I, I heard that um, it's a HTTP R set instead of an SVCB. So um, I, I, I was wondering if uh, there is limited to DH uh, to HTTP and is not considering. Um, uh, dot, for example, in which case uh, I think the same solution should be applied for dot and um, um, and HTTP and though. Yeah, to to be clear, just jumping on that, that is it is a DNS SVCB, and it okay. is defined to work for do dot or any future um, DNS over quick or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, also, um, I mean, um, I just provided a, a comment on the on the mailing list. Is um, um, one thing I I, th I think the working group should look at is uh, um, the look of uh, using a special name. Um, I think we we can do better. Um, I, I have no idea how to do that, but that's something I, I think we should discuss. Um, the other thing is, um, but this may be for the chairs, or um, um, I'd like maybe to remind where the discussion is happening. So is it on the GitHub or the mailing list? So when, when the, the GitHub repo is um, started with um, the, the new update of the draft or the working group document, I think it's uh, something that should be maybe regularly reminded. Um, then um yeah svcb i think I, I am also quite um the the draft from ben i think it's a pretty useful piece of work that um well we should adopt uh, quite soon um similarly the user requirements is something uh, i think is important for the working group um and um um here it should be also reminded uh, maybe to the working group so 
we have everyone participating to the discussion where the discussion is happening. So GitHub, mailing list, and so on. So um, yeah, so that's all for me now. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Chris Box, please. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, so I wanted to respond to Eka's point that this is too much scope. Um, so there are two answers to that. First of all is, of course, that in the charter of the working group, you know, the second item is communication of uh, resolver information to use in selection decisions. Um, uh, but my other answer is, well, consider what happens if we stop work after we after we define how you designate a resolver. You know, what are the client's going to do? Are you expecting that they always follow the designation? Um, it's unlikely to happen, I think, as there's very little to give them confidence that it's a safe thing to do. So we'll probably end up with clients each having their own equivalent of a TRR list, um, which is a lot of fragmentation and work for everyone. Um, so the idea is to, you know, let's standardize something to help clients in their selection decision. Thank you, Chris. Elliot, please. You're going to have to speak double, though. Th thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to reiterate some thanks to Ecker, uh, actually, for his on-list explanation uh, re regarding the um, bindings uh, for, for why you have the IP address in, in a certificate. Um, my uh, and, and that that really helped me advance. I think that's probably a good add to the uh, to the draft. Uh, his explanation. Um, the concern that I continue to have is um, a scalability question around how you know how the number of DO53 resolvers will match the number of uh, uh, DOH resolvers or whatever resolvers that we're, we're calling these things uh, in DEER. Um, and uh, how many of these things have to end up, how many of these IP addresses actually have to end up in certificates? as well as the um, potential topological uh, awareness that might be required for some of this. I think this is an area that just needs to be explored a little bit. I'm fully supportive of adopting the draft, but I, I do think that we have some um, discussion to have over that to continue. Thanks very much. Thank you, Elliot. I believe uh, Ecker is back in the queue. Eric, are you there? Okay, well, I'll hold your spot in the queue, uh, Tommy. Um, yeah, thank you. So just to respond first, what um, Chris was uh, saying about the scope, I, I think I am, it concerns me to say that, you know, we want to, as a working group now, you know, define the policy by which you know clients should trust or not. Um, I think we are creating mechanisms here to do discovery, but leaving it at that and letting the individual client implementations decide what is the right um, trust model for their users and that interaction is something that should be left to those and not something that the working group tries to dictate. And we are best to stay clear away from that. Um, and uh, thank you, Elliot, for bringing up the scalability point. Um, I think that's something that we should definitely continue to discuss and um, have issues about. I think from my perspective, the number of IP addresses in search shouldn't be too terrible. It should represent generally the public resolvers that are being run um, and local network recursives should have a different solution. Um, hopefully that will limit the kind of explosion. Thank you, sorry. Tommy. Sorry, uh, you can, yeah, please. Yeah, sorry, you couldn't find me earlier. I, I managed to mute and couldn't find the, the, the window to unmute. Yeah. Um, no so, I mean, I think, like, first I took a look at the, the charter um, again, as Chris prompted prompt me to. Um, I find this second point to be extremely badly written, so I don't really know what it means. Um, but um, 
it seems like um, you know, communication of DSS relevant information to clients for use in selection decisions, um, that seems like it quite possibly could be the same as the first point, which is allowing you to discover resolvers. Um, in any case, um, as far as I can tell, DEER does define such a mechanism, which is basically you've got an extensible thing which will let you say anything you wanted in that. So the relevant question ought to be what information ought to be communicated. Um, and that ought to be driven by what information clients would consume. Um, to the, um, you know, to the, the specific point um, that, that you raised about, um, uh, um, uh, you know, what information, um, you know, multiple TR programs, stuff like that. Um, you know, I think we do have a worked example of, of like how this works um, in other fields, um, for instance, in, um, in, in CA root programs, where there's a relatively small number of root programs and they publish their roots and then um, consumers figure out how to get those roots and uh, adopt them. So the point where you're thinking you what you have is a centralized evaluation function or a small number of centralized eva evaluation functions, um, I don't really think the primary problem is exactly what format those functions ought to publish their uh, um, their evaluations in. Um, you know, it's it's not like it's very difficult when you when you make the when you make the decision I want to use you know whatever root format trying to figure out like how to parse whatever JSON file or text file they give you is not really your main problem. Um, so um, so to the extent to which that is the problem, I don't think we need to do anything. To the extent to which the problem is um, having a bunch of information with resolvers, um, um, as I say, it seems to me Deere can easily be said to do that. Um, and the interesting, interesting question is what that meta information ought to be. And so far, um, I haven't heard anybody who actually provides um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a customer of, of those resolvers say what information they want that would be plausibly indicated in the, uh, um, in, in the Deere advertisements. Thank you, Ecker. Ben Schwartz, please. Hi. Uh, so I, I want to address a specific point. What I heard Chris talking about was the question of clients applying uh, additional layers of filtering or additional conditions on top of the DEER upgrade to say that they're going to get a, an, an upgrade instruction via DEER. And then they may decide that they don't actually want to execute that upgrade. They have some some additional um, opinions on the client about which upgrades they're actually going to follow, and that's of course perfectly fine within the context of Deer. There's no, you know, it's entirely appropriate uh, or or compatible for clients to simply decline certain upgrade offers. But the Deer draft is not designed to require that all of Deere's proposed upgrades are safe um, according to Deere's own logic. So the, the client doesn't need to have, a, for example, a list of trusted resolvers at where it would only accept upgrades to those resolvers. Um, and so the, the question there really is, you know, is Deere's threat model sufficiently broad that clients are not going to need this kind of additional filtering, or, um, or is there enough sort of divergence among threat models where we're going to need some clients are going to need this kind of additional filtering, or maybe even most clients? And one example of a way that you could get into a state like that is if, for example, the uh, the resolver offers an upgrade that would bypass IPv4 net and essentially um, reveal the, the client's specific machine identity within the network to the upstream DNS resolver, whereas previously its queries would have all been mixed together by NAT or by a DNS forwarder uh, so that the its queries weren't so explicitly linkable from that upstream resolver's perspective. That's out of scope for Deere's threat model as currently, uh, as currently framed, I think. Uh, I guess uh, Deer is still in flux, but uh, you know if that's the sort of thing that I think could result in in requiring a list like that. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I think it's on to Chris now. Chris Box. Hello. All right. Yes. Um, Tommy, uh, I certainly wasn't trying to say that we in this working group should be aiming to tell the client what to do. Absolutely not. Um, I'm simply saying that um, it's helpful to standardize information that we can deliver to the client because they might want to use that information in deciding whether to use the designated result. Um, 
so an, an example of this is um, in the slide deck. So uh, namespaces for which this resolver claims to provide preferable resolutions. Um, you know, that any kind of self description could be useful. And likewise, the directories um, of encrypted resolvers that, that fulfill some attributes. Uh, that's another example of information that could be useful to the client that it might want to make use of in, in its selection decision. We're not saying how it should use that information. Um, that's up to the client. Um, and Echo, um, yes, a CA program could be one way to say that any particular resolver is considered safe by, I guess, by the, yeah, by somebody. Um, I don't know whether that's the right solution. Um, yeah, an open question. Thank you, Chris. Andrew? Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, on a point uh, uh, that, that, that Tommy uh, just made in passing uh, on scalability, um, which if, and, and apologies, Tommy, if I'm misinterpreting what you said, but I think from what you said, uh, uh, you, you, you basically were indicating that DEAR wasn't really applicable um, uh, for uh, the sort of uh, closed resolvers, um, very much more for open. Um, so uh, therefore, going back to the user requirements document, I think we, we do need to make sure we've captured the requirement that's applicable to the other 85% so or so uh, of network traffic. Um, and we don't just solve for an extremely narrow use case. Um, so I think that just underlined to me the importance of we need to look beyond DEAR um, for other solutions uh, um, that are more generally applicable to the bulk of the use, uh, of, of users. Thanks. Andrew, can I clarify something on that? Sure. Um, yes, please. Sorry, yeah. So I, yeah, I, I was referring specifically to the point about having an IP address be in the cert, that that particular section of DEAR applies to the publicly accessible. There are other sections that describe what to do for those other use cases that you're talking about. So it does cover those, but it just doesn't require that private IP addresses go in certs because that is not a valid approach. So I, I, I think that was taken a little bit out of context. Okay, in that case, my apology stands and if I was misinterpreting what you said. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel, please. So, um, I think in the, well, in the first um, interim meeting, we agreed that um, upgrading on public resolver was probably the easiest case. And um, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the following interim meetings were uh, discussing more complex use case that we're um, having on the, the requirement uh, document now, uh, but um, I do not understand why we are having the discussion of closing the working group while we still have no draft being adopted. And uh, I, th I, I, to me, it looks a little bit counterproductive um, because it means that if your use case is not being in the current their specification, then it's not going to be treated by the working group. Or am I? I mean, I'm. I don't. I, I don't understand why we are having that discussion now. Um, to jump in here, uh, yeah. we're in the chair hat, Daniel. So our intention is not that Deer is the only document and, and the only approach that is going to be adopted. As I said earlier, uh, after this interim session. We're also going to be putting up uh, BTW Home uh, for working group uh, adoption, uh, as well as uh, the, the plan is to put up the requirements document that was discussed earlier as well for for potential working group adoption. So we're not. This is not the end of the day. We're not done. Done all the tasks. <laughs> we're only. These are steps along the way. So just let me clarify. Um, so it, I mean, um, should should we understand that? I mean, the draft that's are going to be adopted in the next weeks are going to be the only one that's going to be addressed um, in the working group because currently this is my what I'm understanding from the discussion we're having. 
And uh, I, I think what is important is that we come out with a solution with the, those drafts we just mentioned, and that we focus on those without being so much focused on, yeah, um, will, will we have some uh, opportunity to present the other use cases? If needed, I'm not saying we need those, but what, what? I don't think I, I think it's too early to to mention that no other use cases will jump. And I just want some clarification around that. Uh, the, so, so while there are there have been some assertions that we have uh, enough use cases, um, I, I'm not sure I would call it to be a working group consensus at this point. And so, if other people have use cases that they want. Uh, proposed, this is still an uh, uh, opportunity to uh, write them as um, up as drafts and submit them as well. If uh, the uh, current requirements document as it stands, when we do put it up for working group adoption, uh, if that does come up uh, and does get adopted, then the other pathway would be to make proposals uh, for group consensus for that for additional material to be added to that. Um, uh, requirements document, but we, we're still open. And we're still accepting new drafts. And this is not an end of day. Uh, right, you know, we're not we're not finishing up and, and packing up, ready to go home, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, good. I, I can only say I, I I wondered did anybody else think we were close to packing it up and going home? <laughs> um, but but it's actors back, so maybe we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I'm certainly not suggesting we pack it up and, and go home since we haven't finished here, um, and we haven't decided whether to adopt BTW home. Um, and if and if we adopted, have not finished it. Um, what I'm suggesting is that we confine ourselves to discussion of use cases which are like proximal to the use cases that we the, the use case that we agreed to handle first, which is to say. Um, the one handled by deer and potentially btw home and that we not discuss anything else until we've got those things well in hand and basically solved um and then and then at that point we can discuss whether, the, whether those things ought to be ought to be addressed um with that said you know spoiler alert um my question when that comes up is going to be which client wishes to consume the um the uh, uh the indications which are being discussed because what I've seen um, throughout this process has been an enormous number of proposals for sending information to clients that someone speculates that the clients might use, and that the people um, want to, who want, people want to generate the indications which the clients would use, but I don't see any indication the clients are willing to use. So um, I guess I'd be much more interested in the proposals that I saw at the beginning of this uh, the beginning of um, uh, of this uh, uh, of the session if I heard from some client which wanted to consume them. And I see Tommy's in the queue, so perhaps Tommy wishes to that person. Um, but that seems to be that seems to be a threshold requirement for like any signal of that type. Thank you, Eric. Tiru, please. And in part because I'm not sure whether no, oh, never mind. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I agree with Ecker that uh, there have been several proposals discussing uh, what kind of resolver information can be published, but I, I think we need to see how operating systems and browsers could consume that and it would make their life better uh, in picking the right resolver in case if it's uh, hosted by the network or identifying it's hosted by an attacker. So those techniques and those discussions would really help uh, to get to a level where if TRR program is not in place, is there a way to make the selection better and make the endpoint much safer, uh, especially when uh, the endpoint is relying on insecure discovery mechanisms. So uh, I, I think we should keep our mind open to see if there's any possible solutions and if it that can be easily deployable, then uh, we should definitely consider and look into them. Thank you, Tyr. Uh Tommy Jensen. Thank you. So to Ecker's point and others, the the working group should most definitely not be working on topics that either don't have a strong chance of adoption or that don't address a common need. I think the point in the the first presentation we built today was to call out some specific use cases that have been brought up or that we collectively felt could use working group attention so the working group can look and say this is how we prioritize those and if the answer is the working group thinks none of them are addressable then that's great but at least we had the conversation and said these are important we thought these may be important and we went through and decided they were not i'll give a concrete example though of something that as a client i would be interested in consuming which is 
a specific description about resolver authentication. Um, once you have uh, encrypted DNS servers available, it only stands to reason that you're going to want to have a scenario where the encrypted resolver gates access um, trust. And that would be something I'd be interested in consuming. Today, one could ad hoc that and say, we can use whatever client authentication HTTPS uses, and that's great. And if all we do is say, we recommend that DNS clients do X, where X is already defined elsewhere, that may be the end of that discussion. But for some reason, I suspect that that won't be as simple. I don't think the discussion will be that simple, and it's a discussion we should have. Tommy, just if I may, um, when you say yeah. authentication, I was I, I got lost halfway through, and then I think I understood you properly, but I want to make sure. You're talking about sure. the client authenticating to the server, as opposed to the server authenticating to the client, correct? So, yeah. So the idea being that a private entity may want to have their resolver be publicly routable, such, you know, say that the world was facing a global pandemic that required lots of people to work from off a corporate network. It would be nice to have an employee only access gate on a resolver that's actually routable publicly. Thank you. I've heard that suggested in other places too. So that's that's one example I can think of. And having said that though, I do want to call out, I agree with you that the what Deer and what BTW home address are the highest priorities. And I'm in no way suggesting, I don't think the other authors of that first presentation are suggesting that we get all of these cases shoehorned into those two drafts, rather to define the, the next priority requirements for other drafts to address. If, if I can jump in here with one sure. comment, uh, Tommy, to clarify for anybody reading the notes or watching this video afterwards, that scenario that Tommy laid out of client authentication uh, to the server is out of scope for this group. It's a, not something we're going to work on here at this, under our current charter. And I think Tommy was, you know, Give an idea of future things that could be done at the ITF, correct? So I actually did think that a resolver describing its own authentication requirements would fall under the purview of a resolver describes its own properties, but I'm certainly open to being told that's incorrect. Well, in particular, yeah, I, was, I, I, I was focusing on, uh, on the mechanism that, that that would actually take place of and how the server side, because we're not doing that. I just I, did, I didn't want people reacting that we're trying to take the, the working group into a new direction above sure. and our current charter <laughs> and get mad at David and I. Certainly. And so, yes, I just, yeah, enough's been said. Absolutely. Um, so that's okay. Get mad at me. I can take it. Uh, Eric Orth, please. Yeah, just continuing the discussion a little bit on this point of resolvers authenticating the users and stuff like this. This is something that's come up a couple of times for Chrome, and mostly we've been pushing back on it just because things like client authentication is something that Chrome doesn't support well in general, and we're kind of pushing back and saying if you can do other stuff like proxy authentication, maybe go there instead for this sort of use case, but. At the same time, it does feel like there is some valid stuff there. And we've also been saying maybe the OS platforms are a little bit better positioned to handle it. But as to the point of whether or not this working group should be handling this topic at all, I think it's very clearly within our the scope of our charter when we're discussing things like the resolver advertising, I support this mechanism for client authentication. Actual authentication mechanisms themselves, they might be out of charter. And honestly, a lot of those mechanisms probably already exist in other in other working groups and have already been published as specs. So I don't know if it even needs to be discussed anywhere for creating new such mechanisms, but certainly resolvers saying, I support this mechanism for client authentication. That very, seems very much in scope. And maybe that is one of the things that might be higher priority to handle sooner, although still Deere and Hope are obviously the top priorities. That's all I've got. Uh, yes, and so uh, Peter Van Dyke just brought up a good point, by the way. Uh, thank you for that, Eric. I didn't mean to overlook it. Um, I, I want us to be aware of the time because I think Glenn wanted five minutes at the end of our session, which is imminent. Uh, so I'm going to close the queue right after Andrew and then um, um, and, and then Glenn can wrap up and we'll point out that there's another interim of, of interest to many folks happening about half an hour from now. So. Uh, so, Andrew, please. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that uh, Eka made a, a few minutes back. Um, I don't think it'd be consistent with the charter of the working group that there'd be some sort of gate uh, that the client developers had to buy in to a user requirement before uh, the discussion was pursued within the working group. Um, I don't think that's what Eka meant, but it could have been interpreted as as that. Because um, obviously that that would be rather worrying if uh, um, if we, we we needed agreement from client developers before um, discussing um, wh whether there was a specific user requirement or not. So I just wanted to highlight that um, to make sure that that wasn't in fact what it was driving at. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I do see that both Ecker and Ben want to make a quick comment. Can you please keep them short? Let's start with Ecker. Well, what I'm saying is that if someone proposes a requirement that they think users are already interested in and no client is interested in it, that discussion should be very short because we shouldn't standardize things that aren't going to get implemented. And the same thing would be true for no server being interested in, in, in implementing it. It's just like basically we shouldn't standardize things that only have that require two endpoints that only have one endpoint. Great. Uh, thank you, Ecker. And Ben? Uh, ben Schwartz, uh, I was just going to say that this applies to any two party protocol. Right. Excellent point. And finally, back to you, Glenn, for the wrap up. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I think this has been a, a particularly uh, a good session. So um, very quick wrap up. And I know that a lot of people are going to be a half hour later on DeepRiv uh, at their interim. Uh, so looking ahead to 110 plan, I just want to let everybody know uh, we have requested two sessions at ITF 110. Uh, with the first one being the longer session and then a shorter session later in the week. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the secretary on that scheduling. Uh, if there's uh, particular topics, again, we tend to have found that these things work better as discussion forums versus presentation forums. So if there are issues that people believe that we really should be talking about at the ITF meeting, please let uh, the chairs know so that we can make sure that they appear on the agenda. Uh, and then uh, between now and ITF 110, it looks like we're going to have a couple of proposals hitting the list uh, in the near future for working group adoption. Uh, so stay tuned and look there. And I know none of you are shy, uh, so I, I look forward to hearing all the comments on list. And that's all I have to say, David. Back over to you for the final word. Uh, the final word is goodbye. So, may, may I have a, a second? Before oh, yes, start? absolutely. The, the okay. AD wants a, wants a moment? Sure. Right. For you. Yeah. This is Barry Levy, your, your responsible AD for the next uh, something like five or six weeks. Um, after that point, we were trying to figure out uh, among the ADs who's going to pick this up. And one of the things that's a possibility is, is having the responsible AD not be an art AD. If you care about that, um, that we may move, the area will stay officially an int area but you currently have an art AD as the responsible AD. If you care about how that falls out, you might contact the IASG about that and, and just let us know your opinion. Great, thank you, Barry. I believe that was the final word. Um, see you all next time.